Well, first of all, um, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to be here at uh, Occupy. Um, I'm uh, from Denmark originally, but I'm based at the University of London, uh, where I'm teaching in an international political economy with focus on armed conflicts. The underlying theme of my research has been, and still is, neoliberalism uh, as an economic and political project. And um, I also wrote my doctoral uh, thesis at the same university where I'm teaching now. Um, I've been involved in many different projects. Um, well, I've been involved in the peace movement in uh, Copenhagen, where I was one of the uh, co-founders of the uh, movement in 2002, after the bombardment of uh, Afghanistan started. Um, and then I've been working many years in Africa, uh, mainly in uh, areas of armed conflict, uh, for mid and frontiers, dots without borders. So at these front lines, I gained a lot of experience about what, what happens out there, uh, which is very different from the way in which media usually presents it. So um, when I heard about Occupy uh, Wall Street first time, I thought, uh, and I heard the slogan, uh, we're the 99%, I was thinking uh, this is a movement that has a potential, because uh, I think for the first time in a long period of time, uh, the focus is right. So one percent against the nine, uh, the ninety-nine. You can see from that side, um, because it relates to the to the issue of class struggle, and I believe that some of the most fundamental issues in history that is the class struggle. And I will talk a little about this uh, today. Um, I know people are coming here with very different backgrounds, so for some of you it may be uh, it may be familiar to to these topics, uh, and for others it may be something new. Uh, if you have any questions, just ask, but it would be good if we could wait till the, till the end, So, because uh, we need to go through a lot of, a lot of stuff. Right. Um, are you familiar with this pyramid, all of you, or some of you? It's, um, it's a pyramid of capitalism. It's, uh, it's an old, uh, uh, old poster from 1911. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you see at the top here is that you have the this says uh, capitalism, money on the top. You have the, uh, the ruling elite here, we rule you. At this time it was focusing on the monarch politicians. We have the next layer here, we fool you. <laughs> <laughs> These are the priests and religious leaders. Uh, we shoot at you. So <laughs> <laughs> That's the military and the police. And then here you have the bourgeoisie, we eat for you, <laughs> <laughs> and at the very bottom here you have, we work for you, we work for all of you. So they are holding up the entire system. And um, I think this uh, pyramid of capitalism is as valid today as it was for, for more than 100 years ago, well actually 102 years ago. And I think when we look at the economic crisis now, a lot of what is going on today, we can better understand if we look at it in a historical perspective. Because many of these things, or similar things, has happened before. So we see a history, not exactly repeating itself, but in a new form. And we can understand it by looking back in time, and that's what I will do here. Before that, I just want to give you a small film clip, um, because this is about, we'll, focus on liberalism and neoliberalism. And um, as you all know, Thatcher died recently. <laughs> and, um, oh, oh. The witches. <laughs> That's offensive to witches. <laughs> <laughs> if we can get this film to work, because it's not, not getting the picture here. Yeah. It's just uh, two minutes. <laughs> that woman made my youth a misery. I think that she was to blame for most of the ills in society and most of the things that poor people and ill people are now being blamed for were her fault. Thatcher's death 
I think it's a celebration around the world. Millions of people actually started a legacy, and that legacy was turning over public services and starting the greed for the bankers. And I think everyone knows it started in Britain, and she continued that across her legacy continuum. Today, everyone who don't, don't want that are celebrating. <laughs> Celebrating, yeah, I'm celebrating the fact that Margaret Thatcher is dead today, and uh, I'm here to celebrate with everyone else uh, symbolically to just just to say everything she stood for, I'm opposed to, and I'm proud. To be <laughs> I am celebrating. Yeah, she started the um, the whole neoliberal madness that we're all suffering from now. And people in Brixton suffered. People in Brixton suffered directly because of her policies. I think that, that, that one, of, one of the key words that's mentioned here, that's neoliberalism. And um, I realize that a lot of people have different knows, different opinions and different knowledge about neoliberalism, which is very different. Um, in the United States, liberalism is associated as being something on the left. Progressive uh, in general, I'm liberal. It has a positive connotation. Whereas in uh, Europe and in the scientific uh, research environment, liberalism is something very different. It's uh, pretty far right-wing uh, politics and economics. And um, so we've got to look at, at these issues here. And I will structure this seminar here by first discussing and looking a little about what's left versus right. And um, then we'll look at the history and the origins of liberal capitalism and the critique. Then we'll look at how uh, it transformed through history and then how it came back in the 80s in form of neoliberalism, which then had led to the current economic crisis. <coughs> and then at the end, well, that will be the end of the, of the seminar around 8.30, I have some suggestions on, on how can we can move forward. Um, Jane's presentation will become very well uh, after this because it will focus on finance, uh, capital, and what has happened in the bank sector. So, there's a lot of confusion <laughs> And um, I usually ask some of my students actually, what, what is left and what is right? And everybody thinks this is a very banal question. This is a very stupid question. But then when they start to discuss, they start to realize that they all have different notions of what's left and right. And um, there are different ways of looking at it. You can use a model like this, where you have the, the right here, left here, center, libertarian, authoritarian. There are many different models. Um, but I think it could be interesting just to take one minute, if you could just in two and two discuss very quickly what you believe is left and what is right, how you define it, and just keep it in mind, and then we'll go through it and see. Maybe you will have very different opinions, maybe this is a different forum, so it should be very different, but just take one minute and uh, let's hear what comes out of it. It could be easy to pick up a little bit, but we'll not discuss now and hear what came up in these discussions. But I'm pretty sure that you'll have very different opinions and very different views on what's uh, left and right. But it could be different, it could be wrong. Let's see. <laughs> well, most debates, uh, you could say, today happens is framed, I call it. It's framed from the right to around the center here. <laughs> so the views from the left. They are either ignored or they are marginalized. And it goes between journalism, 
goes in academia, you call it bourgeois academics or embedded academics, same as embedded journalists. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's good to be aware of this because often when you read an article, you not know what has been excluded. You can see what's there, but you may not know what has been excluded. You may not know what to look for and what to ask for. So basically, the, the traditional division of left and right, who are these people here? Mm -hmm. This is the way I would divide it, in the classical Obama, way, Andrew, economic Marx, way. So Thatcher, Adam Smith, Obama, <laughs> we have the old gentleman Karl Marx, Kwame <laughs> Kuhlman, <laughs> and Ellen Dresden Wood. She's <laughs> <laughs> an academic, Marxist academic. I mean, what's interesting here is actually that you see this has nothing to do with color or gender. Uh, note that. Yeah. If color people on both sides, it's about issues about class. Now, the real left is based on, on Marxism. What may be some people, actually quite a lot of people, they feel uncomfortable with this notion. Uh, they feel that when they hear the word Marx or communist, they feel like, okay, this is something dangerous. This is a no-go area, so, so, so let, let's not talk too much about this. Um, I, most of you here lived through the Cold War, so you have experienced the, the anti-Marxist propaganda as well, and it has been massive. So it has been basically eradicated, and there are reasons for that. Because it's basically focusing on the system of production that shapes our world, our social relations. And it's focusing on the capitalist that owns the means of production and the wage laborer that are the people who have to sell the labor power to the capitalist in order to get food on the table. They're forming two classes and they are very antagonistic. And that's where you have the class dropping. It's not just a struggle, you can call it class war, which is also the title of this introduction here. So it goes far beyond this. We'll look at this more in detail. What basically is that um, Marx has done, if you, um, if you read the Communist Manifesto today, it's quite surprising that it could have been written, almost written yesterday, with a few editing, a little editing of some of the wordings. It was quite, quite surprised. Um, when I read it first time uh, before the crisis, or way well before the crisis, I started to realize, hmm, this is actually quite amazing. This was written more than 150 years ago, and still it's so, uh, so up to date. Um, what is actually in this manifesto? It's one of the most influential documents in terms of conflicts in the past 150 years, facilitating re uh, revolutions across the world. Many people heard about it, but very few people have actually read it. And it may be uh, a little <coughs> more innocent than some people thought, think. Uh, some people, other people, it's very controversial. What basically Marx says in the beginning of the manifesto is that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. In a word, oppressor and oppressed stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended, either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large, or in the common ruin of the contending classes. This is very important to keep this in mind when we are moving on here. We must ask ourselves also, why is Marxism so controversial? Uh, why is this small word class uh, so uh, problematic for many people? And in order to find out, we have to look at uh, the other side of it, which is liberalism. Um, the most influential work that lays the foundation of liberal thinking, uh, and now maybe not to be confused about the progressive uh, connotation that it may have, that relates to the, uh, to, uh, the Scottish uh, economist and philosopher Adam Smith and the Prussian philosopher Immanuel Kant. Adam Smith was influenced by the Industrial Revolution and the American Revolution. 
Um, and he wrote this very famous work, The Wealth of Nations, which came out in 1776. What he notes in this work is that politics and economics, well, it's not separated. It goes hand in hand. Today, politics and economics are separated in most universities. But it goes hand in hand, so economics relates to politics and opposite. And he knows that power depends upon riches, and the political economy of every country is to increase the riches and power of that country. Now, for Smith, the best way to ensure riches and power of a country is not through the rule of the church or the monarch, but through the free market. The merchant is, for Smith, the best of all improvers because the merchant is, in quote, accustomed to employ his money <coughs> chiefly in profitable projects and often sees his money go from him and return to him again with a profit. As the early realist considered the selfish nature of humans, Smith also argues that this is correct. People, they, are inte they intend only their own gain, but in this process of seeking their own gain, the people are led by an invisible hand that promotes an end which was no part of this intention. So according to Smith, this promotes that of the society more effectually than, than when he really intends to promote it. This is important because this is about the invisible hand. So when you hear many people saying the market is going to restore itself, it's regulates itself in many ways, which is the key argument of most neoclassical economists today, and what has been taught at the most universities, this is about, comes back from Adam Smith, this is about the invisible hand. It is about also a supernatural force, they argue. So imagine that you talk about an invisible hand today at some of our uh, top leading academic institutions, uh, which is based on superstition, basically. Mm -hmm. This is quite uh, significant. No, economic is, is, is based on this. Then it goes on, it's also this is part of uh, uh, the arguments of Immanuel Kant, when you hear the word about interdependence, Smith, he further links free trade and free market with interdependence between people and nations, and that will lead to peace. So the interdependence, be interdependence between commerce and manufacturing will gradually introduce order and good governance, and with them the liberty and security of individuals who had before lived almost in a continual state of war. So not only it's going to regulate the market, it's also going to promote global peace, which is why you have the free market agenda that should be spread across the world. So this is some of the foundations of it. It's not new, you see, often it's much easier to understand when you read the original text before it has been distorted by, by neoclassical economists. Now, what Marx then does here is that he deconstructs this um, liberal economic system in such a way that the small elites, they feel very threatened. Um, and therefore, they have invested heavily in deconstructing and stigmatizing anything on the left. But what happened here is that Marx is basically revealing the secret of profit making one of the core issues here. You can find the analysis in, in the first volume of The Capital. And also, uh, if you want to go through that, I can refer to uh, David Harvey. He has a very interesting website called Reading Marx Capital with David Harvey. He's at New York, Uni uh, New York City University. Um, as mentioned before, Smith knows that uh, the capitalist sends the money into, circu into circulation and then he comes back with a profit. But he doesn't mention anything about where this profit comes from. And that's what Marx is asking. So where does this profit come from? And um, that's where it becomes complicated. So he starts to develop a value theory. And what, I have to short this down because this is a big area. But what basically comes down is that he, he notes that it, value is created by nature and labor power. Um, then it creates commodities. Commodities can have uh, a use value or a exchange value. Um, in the process of producing commodities for exchange value, he identifies in detail 
how value is created by labor, by and how the capitalist gains a profit from the labor. It's important to, to look a little further into this, if, if you're interested. Um, there's a lot of material to read about it. Basically, what he is here, he reveals the secret of profit making, and that becomes problematic for the capitalist class. Um, because he knows that this capital capitalist class is driven by a restless, never-ending pro uh, process of profit-making and a boundless greed after riches. So it continues to seek to accumulate wealth and continue to enhance exploitation and find ways in <coughs> so that they can increase the, uh, their profit. The capitalists are dependent on market because they need to expand. The more they can sell, the more profit. And so on, he goes on. Um, it relates, when you look into value theory, it relates to why you'll understand why you see so many ad uh, advertisements for eating more, consume more, bigger packets, or buy new uh, when your computer is two years old, change it again. How constantly need outlet? Because the moment people stop consuming, the economy will collapse. And when there's no more market outlet in a, within a nation state, capitalism has to go, capitalism has to go overseas. They need new markets into new continents. And that's what makes capitalism imperialistic. And is associated in particular in Asia, Latin America, and Africa uh, as, imperialist, uh, as imperialism. It was one of the reasons for colonization and then further on neo-colonization. So this is where we have the class growth. People becomes conscious about what's going on. So this small theory, it's a, not a small theory, it's a comprehensive work. But this has mobilized thousands of people across the world uh, into this class struggle, or class war, you could say. Um, think of what mobilizes these people into the streets. Uh, Africa, there was a very strong class consciousness in the 60s. And now it begins here in the United States again. Uh, people start to think about what's happening. Uh, war in Iraq, recession, unemployment. Uh, who's making the money? What's going on? And who's making the money? Question mark. Uh, people are asking questions now. And that's important. Of course, one of the key arguments of, of the capitalism would say that, well, capitalism creates jobs and wealth. Uh, you have the good capitalism and you have the bad capitalism. Uh, good capitalism is more uh, it's not that exploitative and it makes the world go around. So you find a whole body of literature and that's often again framed from the far right to around the center. So those who are around the center, they will think, they will feel they're leftist. In fact, in fact they are not. <laughs> I mean, it's somehow true that capitalism, I mean, it does create jobs, um, because without jobs, um, people end up like this. And then you can say that there's one thing that is worse than not being exploited, uh, uh, that worse than being exploited by capitalism, and that is not being exploited. <laughs> So in that way, actually, it forces people into the system. So that's one of the key arguments. So they say, well, we need to continue, because otherwise, we'll all end up like this. So in this way, we have to counter these arguments. We have to look at, well, actually, how did it all come about? Because it is a powerful argument that the capitalists have uh, on, on this side. We have to look at what is called the secret of primitive accumulation. How did capitalism start? And this is what Marx is doing. And um, um, primitive accumulation is also sometimes referred to as original accumulation, that's what Adam Smith called it, or previous accumulation. But primitive accumulation, uh, David Harvey now uses a term called accumulation by dispossession, uh, which is related to this. But it's often considered as a very abstract, complicated notion, which it is, in fact, not. Because Marx writes that primitive accumulation is nothing else than the historical process of divorcing the producer from the means of production. It appears as primitive because it forms a prehistoric stage of capital. So what it was simply about taking people away from those who own the means of production. 
Means of production can be anything. It could be the land where you can grow your vegetables, uh, your agricultural products. It can be uh, workshops. It can be whatever that, that keeps you alive, uh, that sustains your life. It is a starting point of a capitalist mode of production. And he states that, as a matter of fact, the method of primitive accumulation are nothing else but idyllic. The ec economic structure of capitalist society has grown out of the economic structure of feudal society. The immediate producer, the laborer, could only dispose of his own person after he had ceased to be attached to the soil and ceased to be the slave or serf or bondsman of another. To become a free seller of labor power who carries his commodity wherever he finds a market, he must further have escaped from this regime. Hence the historical movement which changes the producers into weight, weight uh, laborer appears on the one hand as the emancipation, of the, the emancipation of the worker. And on this side alone exists for our bourgeois historian. But on the other hand, these new freedmen became seller of themselves only after they had been robbed of all their own means of production. And the history of this, their expropriation, is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. This is an important argument. Uh, you, may have, you may want to read this, these phrases again, but this is important because basically people have been taken away from, uh, from, from the land uh, in the UK it was closed, it was part of the enclosure movement, but they've been taking away the land so we can no longer sustain ourselves. I found a small video clip which, which simplifies it a bit because it can be a bit abstract uh, to understand, but try to watch this just for, for three minutes and I think you will, you will get the point. Are you tired of living like a, sa like a savage? <laughs> tired of wondering where your next meal will come from? Bored with nothing but agriculture and pastoral living? <laughs> then why not try civilization? <laughs> Here's how it works. Our civilization engineers will arrive and take stock of the situation. They will assess your land value and decide what useful resources your land has to offer. Then, our efficiency experts will determine how best to liberate those resources for productive use. But don't worry, our team won't forget your most valuable resource. That's right, your labor power. Our consultants will quickly organize your people to make the best use of their time and productive energy. Before long, your people will have jobs and be well on their way to a civilized lifestyle. Following a brief period of transition, during which our specialists will help educate the public and counter objections, you'll have all the benefits of civilized society, including wages paid hourly for your hard labor. With these wages, you'll be able to buy food, clothing, and shelter. In fact, everything you used to provide for yourself will now be provided by someone else. <laughs> Plus, instead of having to do a variety of things, you'll only have to do one thing. Your life will be simplified. In your new civilized society, you won't wonder where your next meal is coming from. You'll know it's coming from your next paycheck. As long as you do what our experts tell you to do, we'll make sure you have enough to make ends meet. But wait, there's more. As an added bonus, we'll make sure your kids get an education to prepare them for the civilized life. Within a few short generations, your people won't remember that there was ever another way to live. Even better, your contributions will make it possible for our civilization planners to spread civilization throughout the world. Not convinced yet? Then here's the best reason to choose civilization. There is simply no alternative. Civilization 
It's your future today. <laughs> So that's another way of explaining primitive accumulation. Um, another form of, of uh, primitive accumulation was, was from slavery. Um, over the years, you, well, I assume you're all familiar with the triangular slave trade. So slaves were taken from, uh, from Africa, traded with the, with the Americas, and there was a commercial links with, uh, with England in particular. Now the transatlantic slave trade, that was central for the early industrialization. And it was in the textile industries that were one of the main drivers uh, for capitalism to come about, to get the machinery and the whole development of the way in which we, uh, we industrialized. Um, we don't have too much time to go into this, um, but what is important that when we look at the issue about slavery and the importance for the economic system today, that's where you really realize that history has been rewritten. This graffiti here is uh, coming from a slave castle in Ghana. Um, it says, until the lion has his historian, the hunter will always be a hero. And nothing can be more true in terms of the slave trade. It's also very symbolic when Obama goes to Ghana on one of the slave castles and uh, will have his speech there. It sends a very strong signal about uh, how we have to deal with the past, but also how good it was that we actually moved on and abolished slavery. But there's another side to this, which is that Eric Williams, for example, argues that the whole abolition movement of slavery was one big propaganda stunt. Um, the real issues, the real reasons for why slavery was ab uh, abolished was related to uh, two major <coughs> issues, um, but interrelated. It was um, slave rebellions. The high number of slaves within the US created an acute national vulnerability that was recognized in both the North and the South because any foreign power at war with the United States could see an advantage of sparking a slave insurrection in the United States. Um, Britain tried to use this strategy in the war in 1812, uh, it's a fifth column activity later named as that, so by promising the Indians and, and, and the slaves of freedom if they would support Britain in the war. So it was dangerous to have inside, it was dangerous. Um, and then of course there were the internal slave rebellions. Uh, after the Haitian revolution that started in 1792 and led to the independent republic of uh, Haiti, which became the first black republic, um, that was again based on the French Revolution and so on. But you have the new winds going through the Americas. So you had slave rebellions everywhere. So slave labor became too dangerous. The white people feared for their life. In some places, they were the majority. And if people are conscious about how they're being exploited, um, they become dangerous. At the same time, we have Adam Smith again, the great uh, liberalist, who then writes in his uh, famous work that the gender usage uh, renders the slave not only more faithful but more intelligent and therefore upon a double account more useful. The more the slave approaches the condition of a free servant, the more the slave will possess some degree of integrity and attachment to his master's interest which are virtues frequently belonging to free servants. Slavery is an inefficient mode of production because this more slaves must be employed to execute the same quantity of work than in those carried out by free men. And then he notes that slaves are not free labor. There's a lot of cost attached to it, um, so that it is in the interest of the slave owner that the slaves should be fed well and kept in good heart in the same manner as it is his interest that his working cattle should be so. This is what liberal capitalism is based on from the Adam Smith himself. So he further goes on with an account on actually how expensive it is to use slaves. 
and it become it become conscious. Actually, it's much smarter to use uh, to use free uh, weight labor um, because, well, just as it says, they're more efficient and they're not so conscious about how they're being exploited. And I think this picture here demonstrates very well that if you try to to think of what happens in the minds of these people here when they have the slaves around them. But then think about what we talked about so far. What makes these people walk into the factories and work for the wage? Many situations very badly paid. Of course, worse, different places around the world. So, in this relation, capitalism can be seen or the free Liberal, uh, liberal capitalism can be seen, although it presents itself as a liberated and abolished slavery and slave trade, um, it established another form from Marxist perspective, uh, <coughs> another form of exploitation. So it makes the exploitation more invisible or the chains more invisible. And what happens is that we, in, uh, in uh, the political science, economic science, we talk about forced consciousness. So if people are not aware of how this form of exploitation takes place, they would have a high level of forced consciousness and they would be very compliant to the employer. They would be happy to be employed because they get uh, food on the table, they can pay the house rent and so on. But when people start to think about how the exploitation takes place, they become conscious and that's where you talk about class consciousness. And that's where people start to unite across any lines that try to, uh, to divide them. So here you see in these famous posters you have uh, all different kinds of nationalities and colors. So being class, sorry? And guns, different kind of guns. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> guns, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so what is also important to, uh, to note here is that they know that the, the mechanism of divisions um, used by the capitalist class is to use, for example, the color line, religious line, gender, whatever they can. What they want to avoid is this scenario to happen, where black people unite with white people, Muslims, Christians, anybody unite as one class. So this is probably one of the most complicated things to overcome in social movements, is to overcome these lines of divisions, because they are very, very powerful. And uh, especially in the United States, the notion of racism is very, very sensitive uh, and very well, good way of, of dividing people. I mean, the impact, think of this, the class talk, why is it so dangerous now? I think it become very clear, uh, even though it was just a written work coming, coming from Marx, uh, inspired the uh, Russian Revolution in 1917, the uh, even bigger revolution in China, now an emerging power, uh, Chinese revolution. Venezuela, uh, we have the same thing going on now, so it's not something that belongs to the past. And we have also had in the United States very strong uh, left-wing movement. In Africa, the liberation struggle was guided by the left-wing, Pan the leftist Pan-African movement. They wanted one united socialist Africa because capitalism was associated with imperialism and color, the division along the color line was considered as, as a form of dividing people. Uh, so they wanted one united, what they consider as the white north and, and, the, and the black black south. So this is a worldwide issue. In the United States around the, the first, uh, first World War, uh, you had the industrial workers of the world, it's a very powerful uh, union. So this poster here shows different uh, factions of the uh, anarchist and uh, priest and looking at talking about abstract things and the worker <laughs> says, no, 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 we must organize. And they get into the workplaces and organize. I mean, it's a, it's a struggle they had to go through. Uh, this poster here said, remember, we are in here for you, you are out there for us. Solidarity when the punishment comes for not complying to the the capitalist system. The tool here is important, the strikes. When workers get this class consciousness and they can organize, they can strike and the entire system breaks down. It stops. That's the strongest bargaining power. 
They have a lot of posters, there's just a few of them. This is about uh, how the small elite will react. They show here that they own the means of, uh, of information, the media. They have the biggest uh, megaphone. They're going to say, anarchist, uh, socialist, or, you know, unpatriotic, whatever. And people can hardly hear this movement speaking down there. Huh. I think this picture says more than I can say in, uh, hmm. in two hours. Mm -hmm. Um, the issue about capitalism going abroad, they related immediately to, to war, armed conflicts. Uh, here you see the roots and the bottom, profits, money bags, the root of the tree of war. Soldiers are cultivating the tree, and the capitalists, of course, they benefit from it. They're quite powerful posters, and um, of course there were some reactions. Right. We're going to move up in, in time, and uh, we'll come back to, to some of the reactions. Um, the crisis in 1929, the Wall Street crash, was considered as a crisis related to liberalism, liberal economics. Uh, it led to the depression in the 30s, which was then considered as one of the key reasons for the Second World War. After the Second World War, <coughs> liberal capitalism was, uh, had very little legitimacy, uh, especially in, in Europe where the, where the war was, was being fought. Um, so <coughs> economics in the universities changed. Uh, it became um, Keynesianism, uh, a compromise between socialist planned economy and liberal capitalism. The two most famous people um, that uh, related to, to this uh, debate, that's uh, Milton Friedman on the far right, uh, liberal, promoting liberal capitalism. Uh, then John Maynard May uh, May Keynes, uh, British Fabian uh, economist. The Fabian uh, society in, uh, in Britain considered themselves as being socialist, but they did not promote a revolution, the overthrow uh, of, of the existing system, but a gradual, uh, gradual uh, transition. And that was what the Labour Party in the UK were, was built upon at that time. And these two people had very bitter battles, but it established uh, the economic system moved from what you could say the, the liberal right uh, towards the centre, mixed economy, and it shaped the welfare state. Um, and that was with a massive pressure that came from the left here as well. Concessions had to be given to the, to the workers. Uh, otherwise, Europe was at, uh, at the brink of being simply go complete socialist. Um, the Scandinavian countries, they implemented the most comprehensive welfare system. We can discuss that about later. And the United States, the, the, most, uh, the, the least model. And most of the other countries fell some, somewhere in between. The welfare system basically, very briefly, builds on three main pillars. It's ensuring individuals and families a minimum income irrespective of, irrespective of the market values of their work. Social contingencies such as unemployment support and pensions. And then it ensures all citizens are offered the best standard available in relation to a range of social services such as free health care at the point of delivery, free education uh, and subsistence, so everybody has equal access to education, and free access to information as well. Uh, which is a, an important part of it. <coughs> now, as it happened in, in around the First World War, um, you had this first rate scare in the United States, which crashed, uh, which really hit down on the, on the, um, on the industrial uh, workers of the world. Uh, people were imprisoned, <coughs> some assassinated and expelled. Um, after the Second World War, you have McCarthy's with the second great scare, because in the United States, the socialist movement advancing, and you saw all the campaigns, and also, of course, you had the threat from, uh, it was the Cold War, uh, it came in immediately. The media was mobilized, uh, just one example, uh, for example, a very prominent uh, academic, such as, for example, uh, Albert Einstein, who was uh, stigmatized because he wrote in 1948, an article called Why Socialism. Uh, it's available on monthly review. It's a very interesting article to, to read, explaining some of the, uh, the complexity of establishing a different economic system. But he was labeled as communist, and many other foreigners were expelled. 
Then the Black Panther Party, also built on a Marxist uh, approach, they were inspired by the Pan-African movement, Kwame Nkrumah in, uh, in uh, Ghana, or at that time this place to uh, Guinea, <coughs> and, and a number of other movements. The reaction to this was the COINTELPRO program, uh, trying to split them up uh, in different ways. Then, so the resistance came immediately as a welfare state trying to, to, to develop you have gradually also Friedman and his follower, uh, the, the liberalist, they then try to launch a counter revolution. <coughs> and that basically you could say what marks the beginning of that was the, uh, the coming into power of uh, Thatcher and, and Reagan. It was also related to the Vietnam War and the economy at that time, which we're not going into uh, in details now. But it's a just keep these two, uh, two names in mind, and then also maybe understand why people are celebrating uh, Thatcher's death in, uh, in the UK. A lot of people do it, uh, and why so, uh, so openly, uh, as we saw at the beginning of this presentation. Some of the main features, just a few more slides, some of the main features of neoliberalism is that it, it's rooted in classical liberalism, as we have covered very briefly. Um, Adam Smith and Immanuel Kant, uh, important to, to look at in this relation. It claims that private enterprises uh, are more efficient than, uh, than the public sector, um, even necessarily without evidence for this. There are a lot of studies on it, what's most efficient, private enterprises or public enterprises, but, uh, but that has become like, like a, 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 a truism that, uh, that is rarely questioned by neoclassical economists. It promotes privatization of state-owned uh, assets, or so say uh, public assets, uh, which basically means a transfer of public-owned owned means of production to private families. Then it's uh, deregulation of financial markets, uh, which we'll talk about uh, later, <coughs> finance, uh, finance capital, <coughs> and then increasing the de deregulation of, of international trade. So these, these are some of the, some of the, the, the core sets uh, of neoliberal policies. Um, I will send around a book which is very interesting called Neoliberalism, a Critical Reader, edited by Deborah Johnston, who is on this picture here, and uh, Alfredo Sanfilo, uh, is in this picture here. And they define neoliberalism as a part of a hegemonic project concentrating power and wealth in elite groups around the world, benefiting especially uh, the financial interest within each country. Neoliberalism cannot be separated from globalization and imperialism and relates to issues such as growing power of finance, debasement of democracy, privatization, and the relationship between uh, foreign states and NGOs. A basic feature of neoliberalism is systematic, and this is important, it's systematic use of state power to impose financial <coughs> markets imperatives uh, in a uh, domestic process that is replicated internationally by globalization. <coughs> so many, many people argue that neoliberalism is anti-state. It's not. It wants a particular form of state that ensure that the infrastructure for liberal capitalism to work is there. So uh, it removes a certain set of rights, economic and social rights, which they say these are better taken care of by the free market. This is such as education and healthcare, that's the key argument for this. Leave it to the free market is better than the state deliver these services. Unless we should take <laughs>